My name is Danny Forster, and this is the largest football stadium in America. I'm taking you inside an engineering marvel that could revolutionize the football experience. The Dallas Cowboys' new stadium. All right, let's get in this thing. For a billion plus dollars, fans will see something no one in the NFL will. The steepest retractable roof. Dustin, you're killing me here. <laughs> the tallest movable glass doors. And hanging above the 50-yard line. The world's largest HGTV. And for the first time, the weight of the entire stadium will rest on the two largest interior structural arches on the planet. Giving up to 100,000 fans perfect views forever changing how we build our football temples. But with some of the highest ticket prices in the NFL. $150,000 a seat. Is it innovative enough to lure fans away from their own HGTVs? If any team can do it, it's America's team. The Texans have a way of just making things bigger and better. Only one team in the NFL is both loved and revered enough to be called America's team, the Dallas Cowboys. But after nearly 40 years, their famed Texas Stadium in Irving has fallen into disrepair. So the team is in desperate need of a home befitting their legend. Just 20 miles southwest in Arlington, that home is under construction. I'm inside of the single most expensive piece of sports architecture ever attempted in the United States of America. This will be the Dallas Cowboys' new home field. When finished, it will be the largest stadium in the NFL, almost twice the size of their old stadium, with room for up to 100,000 fans. Designed to be more than a football field, it's a temple to the top grossing team in America. But it comes at a steep price a billion dollars and counting. And one man is footing more than three quarters of that bill. Right, so now coming out of that Lincoln Town car is Jerry Jones, the owner of the single largest sports franchise. Be cool, I'm gonna be cool. Gonna be with you today. I'm Danny. Hi Danny, Jerry Jones. Nice to meet you, sir. Nice to meet you. I've often said um, uh, I don't own the Dallas Cowboys. You can't own Notre Dame or you can't own the University of Texas. I'm just running with the ball for a little while. And it was my job to build a stadium that would reflect uh, what fans expect from the Dallas Cowboys. But gambling his personal fortune is now significantly riskier than it was just two years ago when construction began. Because a fading economy now threatens ticket sales for the first time in decades. It's risk reward. You can hedge them, but you can never eliminate them. And you got to make sure that the payday at the end warranted the risk. To hedge his bet, he's taken on the dual roles of financier and visionary. Creating a revolutionary stadium that changes the way you'll watch the game. On a scale the world has never known. But all of that creates a Herculean challenge for the builders. All right, it's now uh, 7 in the morning. I, uh, I just got on the site, and literally, just as I've arrived here, they're about to do an enormous pick. What we're dealing with here is an enormous piece of steel, a huge truss. 160,000 pounds of steel, the last of 16 trusses, straddling the stadium's most visible features. Two enormous steel arches, a quarter of a mile long each, more than twice the length of the St. Louis Gateway Arch the longest single-spanning roof elements in the world. These arches hold up the entire load of the roof, including the two retractable roof panels, each weighing more than 2.2 million pounds. This last truss will complete the southwest panel. But because it's on the steepest part of the roof, it's the toughest to connect. And even tougher now, 
as 20 mile per hour wind speeds have already delayed the crane lift. We'll have iron workers on all sides of the truss as well as guys fanned out in the center of it as well. It's gonna be a big lift this morning, but this is the last and final one. With this side done, the north retractable roof piece, done. Because of its massive weight and awkward dimensions, nearly 300 feet long and only 14 feet deep, a safe lift would be impossible for a standard crane. All right, Alex, explain to me what that additional counterweight is doing, because I've never seen that before on a crane. On this Manowak, they call it a max room. What it is, it's just like a seesaw. If you've got a fat person on one end, a skinny person on the other end. Right. And we've got a real fat person over here, but we've got a fatter person over there. So what's happening is the additional weight's causing this maxer to float. And you can see you've got about a foot right there that's picked up that counterweight. Uh, I think it's 870,000 pounds. And you see that connection right there and the linkage on the arm between the maxer and the main crane? Yeah. Well, this is an additional length, so we've it's even longer than it would normally be. So in order to add more leverage, you not just put a counterweight behind the crane, but you've stepped it back. And it's still floating. And it's still floating. It's one badass truss, man. With the wind speed dropping below 10 miles per hour, the crew now has a short window to get the truss up. OK, so now I'm actually in the bowl of stadium. And where I'm headed is right there, to the very apex of the arch, the highest point of the building. Just getting to the top in time to see them set the truss is hard enough. And there's only one way up, this steel catwalk, pitched at almost 45 degrees. Now, this top ramp that takes you from the catwalk up to the truss may look and feel relatively secure, but, you know, don't get too cocky, because look at this. Where I'm standing right now, I'm still 300 feet above the stadium. We're not leaving what's considered the safe zone. Beyond this point, 100% tie off. It's somewhat ironic that everything up until this point was considered safe, but that's between you and me. As the wind speed drops, the truss goes into place in a matter of minutes. The piece that just came in from the crane is sitting right there. In fact, you can see those iron workers are working on it right now. That is the piece the crane just brought up. It's just arrived, and they're beginning the fastening process here on the north side. Uh, we're trying to get this base plate down onto this transporter. Right. We're looking at it to make like the hardest one there is out to make. This is it. Uh, it has more bracing in it. It's heavier. It's just more difficult. Here we go. So he's putting tension on the line right now. Now, this should be the easy part, but the holes in the truss are not matching up with the holes in the bracing. It's moving right now. We now have two pins in. So if you look right here, you see this? This misalignment right here means the truss is twisted. Now, keep in mind, the whole truss is 256 feet long. We're dealing with an issue about an inch and a half. It's coming. It's coming? Look, it's coming. Silly, I'll get some bubbles. Is it twisting? Hold it up. So they got it. They finally got it. The truss is down and in place. It's lined up with the steel. They have a pin holding it together. And now to bolt it in place. So with this temporarily lined up, this entire truss spanning 256 feet is in place. The retractable roof is near completion. But unlike a traditional stadium roof, this roof here will create an indoor stadium that will feel like an outdoor stadium. Because keep in mind, everything from the roof to the doors to the HDTV is held up by two giant arches. That arch is 1,290 feet long. But what's so amazing about it is its depth. It's actually only 30 feet deep. Now, had they built this building in a traditional way, they would have put one tall mega column on one side of the building and another mega column on that side. And in order to span that distance from column to column, they would have had to have a massive steel truss, which could have been as much as 100 feet deep, thereby obscuring this amazing open view of the bowl. Dating back thousands of years and perfected by the Romans, arches get their strength from their form. Because while gravity pushes down, the arches transfer that vertical force out and down into the ground. That arch end right there has 20 million pounds of thrust going into that concrete abutment, which then get transferred down 60 feet into the earth. 
In total, the arches transfer 80 million pounds of thrust into the ground, supporting the entire weight of the roof. So Justin, the roof isn't just a roof. The roof is itself a machine. The roof is a machine, and it's one of the biggest machines in the world. On other retractable roofs, the slope remains constant all the way up. But here, the angle changes, steeper at the bottom than at the top. Therefore, the amount of force required to move the panels decreases as it goes up. So pulling it up from the steepest point requires 400,000 pounds of force, while near the top, only 150,000. And how long will it take for this roof to open? 12 minutes. 12 minutes. 12 minutes. It's actually fast and it's enormous. Yeah. Now, you'd think this would be moved by the single largest engine in the world. Instead, 32 motors will move the entire retractable roof with just 480 horsepower. That's about a Corvette. So like a, <laughs> so like a decently strong muscle car. That much force is being applied to get that two million pound piece of steel up here. Right, but it's got a lot bigger transmissions. While it has the strength of a sports car, it's also twice as heavy. So it takes nearly a dozen iron workers tied onto the very steepest part of the roof to install a single tractor. All right, let's get in this thing. Watch it, watch it. Each tractor is composed of two motors that are specifically manufactured just for this stadium. We're in, we're in position, let's get some bolts on now. There it is. So, lefty loosey righty tidy applies even with high level iron working. Happy to know that the rules stay the same. Because you know in Canada it's, it's the other way. Is that right? No, it's not. <laughs> Up next, I climb inside the largest HD television in the world. And a three-time Super Bowl champ predicts how the new stadium is going to change football. When the Dallas Cowboys do something, the world knows. To really appreciate the innovative design of the Cowboys' new stadium, you have to take a step back and know where they're coming from. Behind me is Texas Stadium, the home of the Dallas Cowboys for the past 37 years. While in this building, the team has won a whopping five Super Bowl championships. And no one knows this stadium's history better than the NFL's all-time rushing leader. All right, just show me where it was. Now, I think when I broke the record, I broke it right about up in here. I remember falling to the ground. And if I would have kept my footing, yeah. I probably would have scored a touchdown on it. But it happened right here, Texas Stadium. With three Super Bowl rings, and it proved nothing was impossible. But while this stadium's history might be long, it is severely outdated. Texas Stadium is classic 1970s sports architecture. Basically, concrete donuts to play football in, but not to be seen from the outside. Take, for example, the facade of this building. From where I'm standing, you see the underside of the concrete risers where people sit. You see big concrete ramps that move people around the building, and you see huge concrete buttresses. This building is all function and no form. Still, it was in this arena that the Cowboys sold out games for 18 years and counting. But the new stadium faces a 21st century challenge, which threatens to end that streak, forcing architects to revolutionize design and ultimately change the way you watch games. What we did in the early design phases, we started thinking about the competition of why you would not come here. Right. The number one thing that we heard was, well, I can be at home, I can be in my favorite chair, and I'm 12 feet away from a 50-inch flat screen TV, and I can watch the Cowboys there. So you basically said, how can you take the experience of being on your couch, looking at home theater, and take it to the next level? We did, and we took the distance from the seat to the scoreboard, and then we kept that same relationship, and actually we made it better than what you have at home. So it turned into a 70-foot high scoreboard. And we have the best of both worlds here because you're looking at a, at a view on an HD TV that's better at home, 
And so you're hearing it, you're seeing it, you're smelling it, and that's there's nothing else like that. So instead of looking over your shoulder to see the, the scoreboard, instead you're always focused on the field. Exactly. When assembled, it will be the world's largest high-def TV, 1,200 times bigger than that 50-inch in your home, and as heavy as 30 city buses. Eight cables will hold this gridiron behemoth in the air, four attached to the main arches, and four to the secondary arches, suspending the digital scoreboard 90 feet above the field. Now they're gonna suspend this thing and connect it to the arches, come here, with this. One of these four ridiculously heavy solid steel anchor bolts are gonna get welded to the arch, two on each side, two on the far side as well. And through these anchor bolts, they're gonna run four inch solid steel cables. It will be the first center hung scoreboard in the NFL. And the only place big enough to build it All right, here we go. is right here on the 50 yard line. Do you see this enormous piece of steel behind me? It looks like a portion of a building. And in fact, it practically is. At 70 feet tall and 120 feet wide. The crew has only two months to assemble the framework and screen. So they've created a vertical assembly line, a spider web of construction teams, iron workers, welders, and crane ops. It's so tightly woven, each team must finish before the next, or like dominoes, they fall behind. And right now, these iron workers are assembling the southwest corner of this four-sided monolith, trying to stay on pace with the crane ops, who must lift 30 pieces a day. One of their biggest challenges, not every piece fits perfectly. Are you supposed to get that beam there aligned with that plate right there? Right. How are you gonna do that? I don't know how I'm gonna do it, but it's gonna happen. Watch. Wow. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh! Has it been like this on every piece of steel oh, all the way you up? You gotta work your iron, that's why they call us iron worker. So, J Jason, give me a sense of, of what, it, what it's like for a day out here. Well, we try to hang as much iron as we possibly can, but in a safe way to where nobody can get hurt, but make it fun as well for the guys, you know, to where we enjoy it. Because this is our life, is hanging iron. This is what we do. Most of these guys have worked on lots of stadiums, but this job means more for these longtime Cowboys fans. Does it mean something to hang iron in the Cowboys Stadium? We're building the heart of the stadium that everyone is looking at, everyone comes to see. You know, every time it comes up on TV, your kids get to see it. And they'll say, my dad built that. So, so yeah, it's pretty nice. The HGTV isn't the only design element meant to draw crap. In fact, Jerry Jones and his family circumnavigated the globe, studying the very greatest of stadium architecture. And what they brought back transcends traditional arena design. Mr. Jones, I'm sort of taken aback by your level of specificity from the number of pixels in your screen to the number of hand rests on your seat. Not only have I uh, been involved in uh, every detail, uh, in the design, there are many things in this stadium that architects uh, had to ask me what we were talking about. His details include the exterior facade, composed of customized glass that changes color depending on the time of day, enormous video screens mounted outside for tailgaters, ground level club seats, putting fans closer to the players than any other venue. And up top. One of my favorite architectural elements in the design of this project is something you will not find in most NFL stadia, and that is the clear story window that wraps the very top of the building. And what it creates is this band of light right below the roof. So as you're sitting here watching the football game with all this heavy steel above, you get the feeling, the sense, that the whole roof is floating. And that little sliver of glass circling the dome will provide natural light to the interior. Coming up, it's back in the harness at 300 feet on the steepest retractable roof in the world. And a new extreme sport, a little something the guys call... Let's do this. ...broom surfing. On 
on the Dallas Cowboys' new stadium. Owner Jerry Jones, a self-professed control freak, is involved in every detail of the design and construction, no matter how big or small. How long is our construction period? Jeff, show me what you're going to do to get me downstairs, or we would go through doors inside here. But there's one thing he can't control. Some of the world's most dangerous weather. Arlington sits right in the middle of the notorious Tornado Alley, where up to 700 twisters strike each year. But tornadoes are not the only severe weather to affect Texas. In 2008, just 200 miles south of here, Hurricane Ike blew through Houston, ripping off the roof of Reliance Stadium. Those winds topped 110 miles per hour, and tornadoes around here can gust even faster. So the engineers came up with a windproof solution, which is being installed right now atop the steepest retractable roof in the world. Look at this. It's like, it's like a ski slope. Do you see the, the picture of this thing? 23 degrees is a fine number, but look at these guys. You see where my feet are? Look at my feet right now. I'm like, I'm standing on an ice rink right now. But all the tools, look at this. They literally, they literally bolt the tools down. So as you're walking on the roof, you know, you otherwise would fall right up. <laughs> are you okay? What are the, what are the things I have to keep in mind on this roof? Well, one thing is 100% tied off when you're up here. Yeah. Yeah, 100% tied off. You always have your double lanyard so you can cross from cable to cable. All right. So the good news is we have the, we're tied to the rope. The bad news is I'm tied up to what looks to be like a, a, a bizarre school of yarn. To stay on schedule, this crew must install over 8,000 square feet of roofing each day. That's made even more challenging by today's winds. You cannot put a single piece of material on down and just leave it. No. no. Everything is tied down. Right. Everything. When we started this job in the spring, we had the windiest spring we've ever had in Dallas. When you look at the wind forecast, they're talking about the wind at 14 feet above ground at the airport. You get up here 250, 300 feet in the air, and you can add 10 to 15 miles an hour. It's a lot of roof. Biggest roofing job I've ever done. And the toughest conditions, too. All right, show me how it's done. What are we doing here, fellas? Building a roof to withstand tornado winds all comes down to a five-layer membrane only inches thick. Each layer serves a specific function, retarding fire, sound, and water vapor. And the most important layer, this thin blue vinyl barrier. This is a 10 mil plastic. It's taped down 100% on all the seams. This is just a double sticky tape. Beautiful. It equally distributes air pressure and keeps the roof from blowing off. And this is what you're actually screwing the whole sandwich down to the building with. Correct. Now, you're screwing this down because of, of wind? Yeah, oh, yes. Yeah. Because there's a kind of a funny thing is that as wind kind of careens over the building, it actually makes that negative vortex and tries to pull the roof off the building. Exactly right. So you're actually trying to make sure the roof hangs on. Absolutely. To make the roof completely weatherproof, the top layer is an impermeable PVC membrane. This final step is what lets the rain hit the roof, slide on down the hill. Right into a very large gutter. Okay. Uh, how do we, uh, how do we get back? We walk. Once this glue is down, flip over the PVC and repeat the process. The next step is to get out all the little air bubbles, because that will actually let air get underneath the roof. So they devise a method, broom surfing. They find it the best way to make sure the broom goes down every single time and gets all the air bubbles out. One team comes from the top down, does 50 feet, so 50% of the roof. They jump out, then the replacement crew jumps in. In this case, that's me. This seems safe. All right, feet here. Let's do this. And we're okay. That's cool. After hot air welding the layers together, this now seamless roof can withstand wind speeds of over 115 miles per hour, making it stronger than Houston Stadium. However, tornadoes aren't the only weather-related threat to this building. The sun shines up to 200 days a year, and temperatures can exceed 100 degrees for months at a time. 
Now, the light gray color of this PVC roof is by no means a coincidence. Now, of course, it matches the pants of the Dallas Cowboys uniform. There's that. But there's also an environmental function. You see, if this roof was like a black rubber roof that you typically see on buildings, all this hot Dallas summer sun would hit that black roof and heat up the building. Now, because it's light gray like the uniforms, that sun comes down, hits the roof, actually bounces off, roof stays cooler, but more importantly, the building stays cooler and they use less air conditioning. Because cooling over 2.7 million cubic feet of space, equivalent to a thousand homes, is an enormous cooling load. Now, what are the challenges with keeping something this big cool in a hot Texas summer? There's a lot, especially with all the lighting that's in here, putting up all the heat and the, the fans that are in here. There's a lot of things going into figuring out how much you got to put into here. You have the single largest HD screen in the world. Exactly. And all of that is kicking off heat. Yeah, everything in here, including every single person that sits in these chairs. I don't even want to know what their electrical bill is going to look like at the end of the month. <laughs> that's going to be nasty. No, I'm glad I ain't paying it. <laughs> their goal is to keep the stadium at a comfortable 78 degrees. To do that, they've built one of the world's most elaborate HVAC systems that pumps out 1.3 million cubic feet of cold air each minute. Out of the, the 24 units that are here, I think there's probably just under two miles worth of duct work. Two miles of that stuff right there. Yep. Some of this duct work is up to eight feet in diameter. Right. And just like everything else here, the difficulty increases with the size. Let's get to work. Lead the way. <laughs> the severe angles of the beams make hanging the duct work one of the most treacherous jobs in the stadium. You know, you're out here hanging in the middle of nowhere with not a straight piece of steel to go by. It's a bit challenging. And this is actually the very steepest part of the slope. Correct. Erecting scaffolding from the ground would simply be too dangerous here, so they hung it from the ceiling, something called floating scaffolding. But even with this special rigging, sometimes they can't reach the piece, forcing them to climb off. Slow, slow steps. I'm going go. slow. Slow yeah. step. Slow step. Slow steps yeah. wins the race. I literally, I've cut off all circulation to the front of my right foot. I've basically said goodbye to all the toes there. It's crazy. How much does that weigh, Richard? Oh, about 400 pounds. Hey. Yes, sir. Crank yours up a couple cranks. Is that good, Larry? Ah, uh, you're good. Hey, Danny, you're basically holding that from falling on me right now, so well, I'm, I'm, keep I, it tight. I got, I got your back, man. Here we go. Look at that. That's looking nice. I keep in mind, as you look across the entire bowl of the stadium, there are hundreds and hundreds of these individual pieces that have to get put into place. And each one can take this much labor to just get it in. Oh, man. Larry, what are you doing out there, dude? You can put all the nuts and bolts in. <laughs> well, <laughs> this is what it comes down to. Putting in those last and final bolts in some hard to reach locations, we'll get these last three or four in, and then this piece of ductwork is installed and done. Up next, it's engineers versus iron workers in the end zone when a crisis threatens the erection of the largest movable doors in the world. Even though the stadium is not yet complete, the Dallas Cowboys have already won the right to host the Super Bowl in their new stadium two years from now. Now with three championship rings already, owner Jerry Jones is hungry for that fourth. Talk to me about the idea of having a Super Bowl in this stadium. What if one of the participants in that Super Bowl could be the Dallas Cowboys? But even if the Cowboys make it to the big game, they'll only play 10 home games all year. So to recoup its billion dollar price tag, Jones needs to fill that stadium year round. So designers maximized every inch with a plan that rests primarily on the bottom line the chairs. Because 70,000 seats can be converted into an arena for 100,000 fans in a matter of hours. 
When I was a kid, I used to go to Shea Stadium. Sure, sure. Very uncomfortable. These don't look like this. No, your keister was hurting at the end of the game. It was, right? Yes. So the key is that you're supposed to be sitting for three hours plus, yes. and you're supposed to be comfortable the entire time. And comfortable, very comfortable. The seats are ergonomically designed for comfort, but also to maximize the versatility of the arena. Now, in a typical stadium, each seat is bolted directly to the concrete riser, making them immovable. Here, however, they're installing a single rail per row onto which all the seats are attached. So just by sliding each seat a few inches or removing it altogether, they can completely transform the entire seating area. On a typical seat like in this row, yes. you're affording my butt and my personal space 21 inches. Yes. But you're saying for a Super Bowl, you can actually compress that yes. to about 18 inches. Yeah. If you shrink the chairs up by loosening them, tightening them together, we can add chairs to every row, sometimes two. So that gives Jerry the ability to have a really flexible stadium. But frankly, more to the point, he makes a lot more money. Well, I think he needs to. Electric bill in this place is probably pretty high. Not a cheap stadium. No, I don't think so. Even when you're talking about 2 million cubic feet of space, the importance of one inch can't be ignored. Over on the seats there, one inch lets you get 6,000 more seats in the building, lots more money. While this affords the most flexibility, it also means that the weight of up to 24,000 pounds of Cowboy fans will rest on a single steel bar just four inches thick that relies entirely on the strength of the bolts. All right, French, give me some juice. The installation team has one of the tightest schedules on site. All right. They've got to install 500 seats each day, which breaks down to just about 10 seconds per hole. To do that, they've had to soup up their drill. This looks basically like a shopping cart with two upside-down drills stuck to it. That's basically what it is. Gino's got it set up that it's, it drives like a Cadillac. <laughs> So this actually represents a tremendous amount of innovation over, over the years. Oh, yes. Faster. So we can do 45,000 holes in 11 months. The battle you have here was with some rebar. Hopefully, you get some nice, smooth holes, but it's a struggle once you uh, hit the rebar. Every time he hits rebar, he's got to mark the spot and go back to redrill it. French's job of 8 to 10 seconds turns into 5 to 10 minutes which is fine and dandy, but when you're thinking about a stadium with over 70,000 seats, those few seconds add up to additional weeks or even months of labor. With the holes prepped, the crew can now fasten the brackets to anchor the railing. There you go. Now, finally, right, at long last, comes the bar. Lift it up. James, now that we have the beam sitting on the brackets, it is secured, it can take the weight. Our last and final step to make this thing really look like a stadium? Put on some seats. Put on some seats. With everything in place, just how long does it take? Everybody ready? We're ready. All right, here we go. 72 seats in just five minutes, and they can remove them just as quickly. And that's it, beautifully done. Nicely done, well done. Creating the world's most transformative stadium extends beyond just the seats. In fact, all the way down in the end zones, parallel retractable doors that will open or close in a mere 18 minutes, transforming this traditional football stadium into a veritable outdoor arena. And it's all thanks to a few enormous movable parts. I, I get that everything in Texas is big. You know, I, I, I know the joke, I get it. But you guys have 120 foot tall doors, glass doors, that will literally open up both sides of the stadium. Both sides. Why would you do that? What we did here was we created so much more than just a place to play 10 football games a year. And if you open up both the end zone doors, right. and you open up this massive retractable roof, it's going to feel much more like a convertible than it is a moonroof or a sunroof in a car. But erecting the world's largest movable doors has forced the crew to perform a lift they've never done before. 
Down at the southwest end zone, they're prepping the lift of the first panel. Now, J.D., what's taking you so long? <laughs> what's taking me so long? We've been having to wait on you. Uh, right now, they're hooking the spreader beam up to the first wall truss. We're going to tip up. We'll get it hooked up, and we'll get everybody ready. And we'll just tip this wall straight up. This is the first of seven glass and steel panels for the south end zone, each 120 feet tall. Out of the seven panels on each end zone, five will be mechanized to open or close, rolling on a bottom rail and guided by a top track. Now, when all five are slid to the side, they'll create an opening that is 180 feet wide and 120 feet tall. Jerry Jones said he wanted more than a sunroof. He wanted a convertible. That's his convertible. Because the panel will come dangerously close to the steel arch that holds everything up, engineers had to design an entirely new system to get the panel in place. So Justin, you designed this hinge system right here. That's correct, yeah. It's a specially designed pivot mechanism that's used just for lifting all of the panels. So just to be clear, about a 120-foot tall door frame is going to be resting on this hinge. And right now, it's lying horizontally. And pivoting off this hinge, it's just going to fold 90 degrees into the vertical position. We rotate 90 degrees up. We're going to lock in the top connection then. And then that hydraulic you see down there on the bottom, we're going to release the pressure on that. That'll drop the whole panel down onto the plate you're standing next to. You're actually splitting the load of this thing half with the crane, half with your hinge. Yep, and uh, once we get to the top, though, all on the hinges. Engineers developed a system to carefully transfer the weight from the crane to the hinge. But even with this hinge system, there are only inches of tolerance. Now for the last safety check and a little known construction ritual. All right, so this is what we do before every big lift. what we do. We all touch the turtle. Jade is very good luck. Turtle is very long life. All right, so let's rub the turtle. Rub the turtle, and then we're good to go. <laughs> Do it? Let's do it. All right, Jim, make the call. Let's do it. All right, everybody, heads up. Here we go. Juan, you got the call. There it is. This is coming up right now. And what's fascinating is, check this out. You'll see the bottom side is not moving. The bottom side of this load is on hinges. And this side, it, literally, it's just kind of folding right up into place. So right now, as this thing starts to go past the 45 degree point, it's going from sharing the load to now actually shifting the load onto these hinges, right? Yeah. As we get it up to the top, it'll be taking 100% of the load. Justin spent months developing this plan, but there's still the question of whether this can clear the arch. There's some plates we got to clear on this arch. We're going to come real close to it. On the main arch? Yeah, main arch. We're going to come close to it on the other side. Oh, Coming up. On a lift of 66,000 pounds. Some of the dimensions are off. Just a few inches could threaten the lift. To finish the new Dallas Cowboys Stadium before opening day, the crew must overcome seemingly insurmountable challenges that come with building on this scale. This morning, the first panel of the world's largest retractable doors is proving a bit more difficult than anticipated. The plan was to use a specifically designed hinge to rotate the panel into position and keep it from colliding with the arch. Once upright, these small hydraulic jacks were supposed to lower the panel safely to the ground. But that's not what happened. It, it looks like we're not going to have enough stroke in the jack to set it all the way down. So somewhere along the line, some of the dimensions are off. In other words, even with the jacks fully retracted, there is still a gap between the base plate and the bottom of the panel. The distance from the bottom of the plate to the concrete should have been about an inch and a half. And that's how much the jack would have let you drop it down. Right. Yeah. And at this point, we have about, about a four inch gap, but you'd only accounted for about an inch and a half down. Correct. He's falling his head? Well, no, it's the film crew. <laughs> it's always my fault. It's always my fault. Right now, two fixes are on the table. One from Justin, the lead engineer, and the other from JD, the superintendent. 
I haven't been in a situation yet that I can't calculate myself out of. JD hasn't been in a situation yet that he can't cut and weld his way out of. <laughs> so um, what's, what's the final solution? Well, plan A is to drop it down just like we were going to, set it onto a beam. That beam will already be on jacks, and then we'll, we'll jack it down. So really an intermediary step. <laughs> yeah. But if we don't have the geometry to do it, we go to plan B. Plan B is what? Give JD a torch and a welder. Let him do his work. We'll cross this bridge. It'll just take a little longer. Yeah. Now for the engineering solution. Oh, it fits! Sticking a steel beam across the jacks may provide them those extra few inches they need. If Justin's geometry is right, the temporarily jacked up beam can support the panel. Using these hydraulic rams, we're gonna jack the entire door up a couple inches. While up in the air, we're gonna get this whole hinge apparatus out of the way. With it clear, we'll then slowly lower the door back down, and once it's down, that bottom edge should sit happily and flushly on the concrete. Come on up. With these hydraulic rams now fully extended, this crossbeam is holding up half of the weight of this entire door frame. So a 66,000 pound door, that means this beam right here is carrying 33,000 pounds of weight. All, come here, under that little jack right there. But the job's not done yet they still have to transfer the weight of the door from the crane to the base. All right, Juan, we're fixed to start coming down. You ready? Yes, sir. You coming down now, JD? Yeah, I'm going to try to bring it down slowly. Y'all get out of the way. Randy, how close are you to touching? I'm holding it a half. Juan's trying to go east bad. Right now. The far side is actually down flush and level, but this side is still a half inch off the ground. So the problem is they're not quite sure exactly how to bring it down, because the farther they bring it down, it actually starts to swing into the building. Those are three eights. To make it flush, JD has a solution, a thin piece of steel from the scrap pile. Because this is one of the fixed panels, that little piece of scrap will now become a permanent part of the door. All right, what we're doing, we're putting our shims in right here. Now, why put it there as opposed to in the center? All the loads are transferring right through the tube itself, through the base plate, down to the shim. So if you put them in the center, you get a potential of bowing that plate. So, J.D., basically, those shims are going to be absorbing 33,000 pounds of force coming down on there, right? Yes, they will. You can hear it. You can hear that sound, right? The steel on steel. You can now hear that. The steel, you can hear that. You hear that? That's that little crinkling noise. You literally can hear that 33,000 pounds of steel now resting on top of that shim, that metal on metal connection. So she's down. She's down. So based upon today's success, in a couple of weeks, the full wall, largest retractable doors in the world will be functioning happily and nicely. They'll be fun to watch. All right, so there you have it. The single largest retractable doors ever. Congratulations. Thank you. Amazing, amazing. With opening day just six months away, it'll take both engineers and construction workers to finish this job. It's going to be awesome. I mean, there's no other way to describe it. So when you're standing on the 50-yard line in the new stadium, on, the same, on a new star, in the new building, it's going to be history moving over there. But it's going to be awesome because it's going to be a beautiful, Mind. Despite the economic downturn, the Dallas Cowboys' new stadium is 80% sold out. Sports has a role, and it's a respite for hard times for people to move away from the real jobs. This stadium is going to help people do that. Because in a state where football is more than just a game, this stadium will be more than just a field. The things that make a great football stadium oftentimes do not make a great piece of architecture. So for me, what's so fantastic about what the Cowboys are doing is that I think they've actually succeeded at doing both. Thanks to some amazing design, to some bold engineering, and a maverick owner, these guys have come together to create a building that won't just change what it's like to watch football, but will also change what people think a stadium can be.